Hi everybody, this video is for section 9.1, all about significance testing, also known as hypothesis testing, they're synonymous terms, and I want to start this video with a confession. I really like cheeseburgers, especially Wendy's cheeseburgers. They're the tastiest ones to me, and they say they have a quarter pound of ground beef in them. That's a whole four ounces. But sometimes I suspect that the amount of ground beef isn't quite four ounces. That maybe sometimes it's a little less. So in this video, we're going to take a look at how I could use a significance test to maybe prove that Wendy's cheeseburgers have a little bit less than four ounces of ground beef inside of them. So first, some background. Well, something we could do to try to prove that Wendy's cheeseburgers are underweight is I could buy a cheeseburger and weigh it. But looking at just one cheeseburger doesn't seem really fair. What I really should do is take a random sample of many different cheeseburgers, which would be kind of a fun experiment. I could weigh them. I could take the amount of ground beef in all those cheeseburgers, and then I could find their average. And I could use that average and compare it to the number four. And you have to think about how much evidence would it take for me to be able to prove that Wendy's cheeseburgers really are underweight. How many hamburgers should I buy? How much do they have to average for me to have conclusive evidence? So first of all, a significance test here is a formal procedure for comparing the observed data, here are the cheeseburgers, versus a claim. And here the claim would be that Wendy's cheeseburgers have four ounces of ground beef. And we want to assess the truth of that claim. So first of all, some procedure here. The, test of a, uh, the steps of a significance test. First of all, we're going to state a hypothesis and define parameters. Here in this problem, the hypothesis is that Wendy's cheeseburgers really do have four ounces of ground beef. Next, we're going to collect some data and perform calculations. I'll probably take a simple random sample. I'll look at the data, probably have some normality involved somehow. We'll take a look at how unusual my sample is using procedures from other chapters and some mathematics you've already kind of mastered. And finally, we'll compare our results to what could reasonably occur by chance. That's called statistical significance, and we'll report our findings. Because what we have to think about is, if I take a batch of hamburgers and take the average of them, well, perhaps I was just unlucky and had an unusual, unusual batch. Or perhaps it's really true that Wendy's cheeseburgers are really less than four ounces. I have to take some measurements to be able to find out which of those I believe is true. Some assumptions will occur. First of all, we have to assume that our data was collected appropriately, meaning we had a random sample, or maybe we took a well-defined experiment with a control group, and we'll have to have a large population. Here, there's certainly a large population of cheeseburgers. Assumptions will also be down the road that perhaps something is normal here, hopefully a sampling distribution, maybe the sampling distribution of P hat or of X bar. And actually, we're going to see some other procedures as well that don't require normality. Okay, so first of all, some terminology here. The statement being tested in a significance test is called the null hypothesis. Here in this problem, it's the idea that all cheeseburgers have a mean weight of four ounces. And the symbol we use for that is H sub zero. That's called the null hypothesis. But there's also another hypothesis in a significance test. That's the statement that we suspect is true. Here, I suspect that Wendy's cheeseburgers are actually less than four ounces on average. And we call that the alternate or alternative hypothesis. And the symbol for that is H sub A. So some strange symbols in this section. I think you'll get used to them quite quickly. So let's take a look at some examples here. A government agency has received complaints from people like me that they think Wendy's might be selling underweight hamburgers. The restaurant advertises that its patties are a quarter pound of ground beef. The way we write the null and the alternate hypothesis here are like this. We have a null hypothesis that the mean equals four versus the alternate hypothesis that the mean is something less than four. And here I have to define the mean, that the mean is the mean weight of all patties. This is the population mean that I'm trying to prove or disprove. Here's another example. Oh, by the way, that's called a one-tailed test. Because if you think about it, down the road, we're going to think about these as normal curves, where four ounces would be right down the middle. And I want to look at how unusual my sample is. Here I'm only looking at it one direction. It will be a one-tailed test. Now here's another example. A car dealer advertises that its new sub subcompact models get 47 miles per gallon. You suspect that the mileage might be overrated, that it's probably something less than 47. So again, I have a null and an alternate hypothesis. The null is that the mean is 47 versus the alternative that the mean is less than 47. And I have to clearly define what mu stands for here. It's the mean gas model mileage for all cars of this model. And again, this would be a one-tailed test because I'm only looking at it in the less than direction. But here's something that's not one-tailed. Sort of a long explanation here, but we suspect that the fuses, or the fuse is supposed to be 
40 amps. If they go greater or less than 40, either direction, we have a problem. So I don't care where the problem occurs, I just want uh, evidence that we get away from 40. So here the null and the alternate hypothesis look a little bit different. The null hypothesis is that the mean is 40 versus the alternative that the mean is something other than 40. And if you think about this, I'll have a normal curve but with two tails. Hence, this is called a two-tailed test. And we just call mu the mean amperage reading for all fuses. So different ways of writing null and alternate hypotheses. Okay, let's go back to my hamburgers again. Let's say I collected some hamburgers and I took their mean weights. What if it came out as 3.95? That doesn't seem really that far away from 4. What if it was 3.88? What if it was 3.81 or 3.72? Some of these would provide stronger evidence against the claim that the patties are actually four ounces. And the way we assess this is by using a p-value. What a p-value is, it's the probability, assuming that four ounces is true, assuming that that null hypothesis is true, that the statistic we collect would take a value as extreme or more extreme than the one actually observed. That's called a p-value. And the smaller the p-value, the stronger the evidence against the null hypothesis. So p-value is essentially the probability of getting the sample you got in your experiment or your data collection if the null hypothesis were true. And that leads us to the idea of statistical significance. Back in an earlier chapter, we defined statistical significance as the observed results would rarely occur by chance alone. Now we can actually measure that number using p-values and statistical significance leads us to the st significance level. And we use the symbol alpha for significance level. What a significance level essentially is, is where is that line we're going to draw where we believe that something would rarely occur by chance alone versus there being an effect present. We're going to call it alpha. Some common significance levels are 5%, 1%, and 10%, although we could certainly use different ones. Also, if the p-value is smaller than alpha, we say that the data are statistically significant at the level alpha. In that case, we reject the null hypothesis, and we will conclude that there is convincing evidence in favor of the alternative hypothesis. We're going to see a lot of these in practice, so it's really just a lot of strange language right now. But here's one last example. It's a bit wordy, but basically it's about collecting data on AAA batteries. And I see the null hypothesis is that the battery should last on average 30 hours. We took a sample of 15 batteries, and we suspect that they actually last longer than 30 hours. We collected some data, and we see a p-value here of 0.0276. Well, that's certainly less than 5%, which would be a common alpha to use, so this would cause us to believe that the results are statistically significant. Since that p-value is less than a predefined alpha, the sample result is statistically significant at the 5% level, and we now have sufficient evidence to reject the null hypothesis in favor of the alternative and we conclude that they last thir more than 30 hours on average. So, so far, just a lot of terminology in later sections now. We'll take a look at how to apply the mathematics and combine them with what we know about hypothesis tests.